In Northern California, a car crashes down an embankment in the dead of night. Rescue workers scramble to save a couple trapped inside. But the routine investigation takes an unexpected twist when details about the victims are revealed. Not far away, in Palo Alto, a woman is found dead at the bottom of the basement stairs. As detectives look into the accident, they begin to question the sequence of events. Sometimes, first impressions mask the truth. A tragic accident, a happy marriage, a solid alibi. In the face of murder, all these come under scrutiny. To solve the demanding cases, investigators must sift through the debris of shattered vows. episode, some of the names have been changed. El Dorado County, California, the golden country, where traffic is light and barely lit roads are the norm. On October 27th, 1992, one of those roads offered up a deadly turn. Around 8 p.m., a man driving alone noticed swerving headlights in his rearview mirror heard a crash. When he looked back, the car was gone. Fearing that someone was seriously injured, he turned around and pulled off to the side of the road. He saw the vehicle at the bottom of the embankment. He ran down to help. The woman sat motionless. Her companion sat dazed and in pain. Fire emergency. A car went over the embankment. Are there people injured? Yeah, there's two people inside, and I think the driver's dead. The other guy's hurt real bad. Units from the Folsom Fire Department raced to the scene. Officers from the California Highway Patrol and other emergency personnel move quickly to rescue the victims. Rescue workers carrying equipment help each other down the steep embankment. Paramedics confirmed the woman was dead. The passenger identified himself as Mitch McLeese. He said he couldn't move his legs. Paramedics suspected internal injuries. When asked about the accident, he said he couldn't remember much. He told them he was a friend of the woman who was driving. Her driver's license identified her as Susan Moyer, a 52-year-old woman from El Dorado. McLeese said he must have fallen asleep. When he woke up, they were in the ditch. Paramedics rushed the passenger to Sacramento Medical Center for treatment. A deputy from the El Dorado Sheriff's Department arrived at Susan Moyer's home around 11 p.m. He told Ken Moyer his wife had been killed in a car accident. 
The officer asked questions, gathering information about Ken's wife, Susan, and her passenger, Mitch McLeese. Moyer said McLeese was one of his employees. He also told him that McLeese helped them move to California from Sarasota, Florida. Ken and Susan were newlyweds, and McLeese stayed on to do some work in their new home. That evening, Moyer had to leave for an appointment around 7.15 and couldn't take McLeese back to his hotel. Thank you. Susan offered to drive him when he was done. Moyer said when he returned home around 8.30, Susan still wasn't home, and he began to worry. He drove around searching for her. Moyer told the deputy he blamed himself for the accident. He said if he'd taken McLeese home, Susan would still be alive. Now I left. The next day, an autopsy was performed. X-rays revealed the victim's fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae had been fractured and dislocated. Susan Moyer had broken her neck. The victim's eyes were black and swollen, indicating Susan's head hit the steering wheel on impact. According to police reports, the car had rolled down the steep embankment. The coroner determined her injuries were consistent with the accounts. The death was ruled accidental. Susan's body was released to her husband. She was cremated and her remains sent to her hometown of Sarasota, Florida for burial. Police are required to investigate all traffic fatalities and went to the hospital to follow up on passenger Mitch McLeese. But the nurse informed the officer that McLeese wouldn't let the doctors perform any tests and had checked himself out hours earlier against doctor's orders. At the El Dorado Sheriff's Office, Lieutenant Jim Roloff had questions. The only witness to the accident had left town, and it seemed suspicious. Our seriously injured victim, who was supposedly in the hospital dying, has checked out and gone home to Washington, the state of Washington. So, uh, you know, at that point, things started not looking too good. Lieutenant Roloff reviewed the autopsy report for anything out of the ordinary. He found nothing. But all that was about to change. Lieutenant Roloff. In Sarasota, Florida, a detective from the Special Investigations Unit relayed information to Lieutenant Roloff from Susan Moyer's family. She said they didn't believe her death was an accident. Florida investigators told Roloff they conducted a preliminary background check into the Moyers. They discovered Susan was recently awarded a $3.7 million settlement when her first husband was killed in a small plane crash. According to family members, Ken Moyer came into her life shortly after she received the money. This information raised suspicions. Roloff and his team decided to re-examine the accident. The first thing that had to be established is how did this woman die? And was it in fact as a result of injury suffered in the accident or was it from some other means? California Highway Patrol's major accident investigation team, known as MATE, was called in to help find an answer. At the scene, the investigators reconstructed the accident. They measured the slope of the embankment and the length of the tire tracks to learn exactly how the car ended up in the ditch. Paul Whiting headed the investigation. We get an approximate speed of the vehicle, the amount of time that it took for it to come to a stop, 
From that, we can calculate the forces, the approximate forces that the vehicle experienced uh, as it dissipated its energy coming to a stop. Broken branches would also help gauge the force of the car's descent. The greater the damage, the harder and faster the car tumbled. Though the trees showed scars of the accident, Whiting and his team found that the damage was minimal. We determined there simply wasn't enough force generated to the vehicle and thus to the occupants of the vehicle to produce the deadly injuries that she received. The investigation team now needed to closely examine the car, which had been towed to the impound lot the night of the accident. Paul Whiting was puzzled. He found the car's condition particularly unusual. We could find no significant damage in the interior of the car. We checked the uh, steering wheel. It wasn't bent in any direction. There was no marks in the uh, dashboard. The pedals were all intact. There was nothing on the interior of the car that would have suggested a significant human impact with any of those structures. Investigators checked for blood or fibers to determine if Susan Moyer or her passenger had hit the windshield. No evidence was found in the glass. Whiting concluded the glass shattered from the stress of the collision and not because one of the passengers hit their heads on the windshield. The exterior of the car also showed little serious impact. The uh, damage to the left front is the only damage that is significant at all. At the most, it would represent a speed change of 10 miles an hour. Now, the forces in a 10 mile an hour speed change would be comparable to uh, backing into a light post from a parked position. So it's not the kind of forces that we would expect to see uh, fractured necks or, or death producing injuries from. Whiting and his team found no evidence the car had rolled over or that it was involved in a serious accident. Lieutenant Roloff read the mate report and grew more skeptical. As you start down this road, everything you're developing says that this accident is not what it appears to be. Authorities now believed Susan Moyer's death was not an accident. But proving it would not be easy. Susan's body had been cremated and all physical evidence of her death destroyed. In El Dorado, California, Susan Moyer was found dead at the scene of a car crash. After reconstructing the accident, investigators now believed she was murdered. And they discovered there was a possible motive. Police grew suspicious after they learned the victim's new husband stood to inherit almost $4 million upon her death. Detective Sergeant Hal Lamb of the Homicide Division discussed the mate findings with Lieutenant Jim Roloff. They were telling us that the forces involved in this accident weren't sufficient to cause the broken, the broken neck. Because Susan Moyers had been cremated, Detective Sergeant Lamb had to rely on the original autopsy report and details observed at the scene. Fortunately, the, the night of the accident, we had a sheriff's corner investigator that had gone out and took a series of photographs of, of Susan inside of the vehicle, and so we had those to work with. The photographs revealed the position of the body, blood patterns on the victim's face, and bruising around the eyes. Armed with this new information, investigators turned to the Sacramento Forensic Services Department and Chief Medical Examiner Gregory Schmunk. He reviewed the reports, photographs, and eyewitness accounts of emergency personnel at the scene. 
The description that there was bruising around both of the eyes within uh, seconds to minutes after the accident, as described by the paramedic on the scene, would be very unusual. It, it takes some time for that bruising to occur because the blood has to seep through those soft tissues. That indicated to me that the death had occurred prior to her driving off the road. The photographs also showed dried blood patterns on the victim's face. These blood stains ran down the side of the victim's face toward her ear. But the effects of gravity after the accident should have made the blood drip down the front of her face. The uh, blood pattern on the body was not consistent with the way she was positioned in the vehicle. Schmuck closely examined the autopsy report in light of the California Highway Patrol's analysis of the accident. There was a fracture of the mid-neck that was inconsistent with any type of fracture that I'd ever seen in a motor vehicle accident such as the type that Susan was in. There was no rollover, there was no uh, significant impact. So the location of the fracture was unusual for that type of uh, incident. I'd concluded that uh, the fracture of the neck and therefore the cause of Susan Moyer's death was not due to a motor vehicle accident. Now they needed to find out exactly how this woman died and who wanted her dead. It's worth it though, I think. They turned to her husband, Dr. Ken Walker. Moyer, and the only survivor of the crash Mitch McLeese. But McLeese had abruptly left town after the accident. And Ken Moyer had returned to his home in Florida, where he owned a sporting goods store. Police spoke to those closest to the couple. They were hoping to find out more about their relationship. Close friend Kyle Dallinger lived nearby. Kyle told police Ken Moyer was distraught the day after the accident. Moyer asked him if he would drive him to the hospital to pick up his friend Mitch McLeese, who was checking out. The neighbors said he saw Ken Moyer hand McLeese a plane ticket. He was told Mitch McLeese was not going home, but relocated to a small town outside of Seattle. Given this new information, the police were beginning to uncover a murderous plot. We really felt that Ken Moyer was the brains behind this whole thing. We thought that it was a, a homicide for, uh, for money at that point. And we, we felt that uh, Mitch McLeese was just the hired hand. Detectives went to Washington to interview McLeese. When detectives identified themselves, he was shaken. Yeah, actually, we're detectives from Eldorado County Sheriff's Department. I'm Detective Hal Lamb. This is Detective Bill Wilton. We're here to talk to you about the accidents you were involved in with Susan Moyer. McLeese stuck to the story that Susan was driving and he had fallen asleep. He said he woke up just as the car plunged down the embankment and didn't know what caused the accident. Because of everything they had uncovered, detectives knew they weren't getting the whole story. He was lying. There's no question that he was lying. But we didn't really have enough physical evidence to arrest him at that time. They needed more. So Lieutenant Roloff sent detectives to Sarasota, the Moyers' hometown, to talk to the people who knew them best. I made a list of some individuals that I felt uh, warrant some further questioning. Uh, the first they met the local questions. investigators who had been gathering information about the Moyers and their employee, Mitch McLeese. Mm -hmm. The detectives learned about an affair Ken Moyer was having with a woman by the name of Betty Ann Brown. Detectives interviewed Brown, who admitted she'd been seeing Ken for the last two years. She was shocked when she heard he was getting married. 
But he assured her that his marriage would not interfere with their relationship. This part's okay? Absolutely. And Ken Moyer kept seeing Betty Ann on a regular basis. She admitted that they'd had a, an intimate encounter just before the wedding. The day of the funeral, they had an intimate encounter after the funeral, and she even gave us the, the location and the time of the, of the motel that she met with him. Detectives began interviewing employees at Ken's sporting goods store. And it seemed as if everyone had a similar story to tell. According to everyone who knew him, Ken's marriage to Susan was not about love. We learned from all the people that we had interviewed that it, that it was apparent that Ken Moyer had married Susan for her money. And that Ken really didn't care for Susan. He had told one of his employees, it was a question-answer thing, uh, Eddie, do you know why someone gets married? And Eddie says, for love, and Ken says, no, it's for money. Police now had a clear motive, but the crime and the crime scene still remained unclear. They now believe the accident was staged to cover up Susan's murder. But linking Ken Moyer and Mitch McLeese to the killing would take more than motive. It would take proof in the form of forensic evidence. California detectives began investigating an accident, but ended up uncovering a murder. They believed Ken Moyer had paid one of his employees to kill his wife, Susan. Although the circumstantial evidence was compelling, they had no physical proof. Investigators Lamb and Roloff now believed they knew how Susan had died, but they still had no direct evidence to prove that Moyer or McLeese had killed her. Four months after the crash, a newspaper article prompted a local handyman to contact police. The worker told detectives so Ken Moyer had hired him to reroute some tiles in his foyer. First layer, it wouldn't be a problem, and just relay everything. But he wanted the grout and everything taken out completely redone. Okay, Chuck, here's the spot that wants. Moyer explained that he'd spilled cherry cough medicine, and it had penetrated the grout. The worker told Moyer that he didn't need to replace the grout; just scrape and regrout the stained portions. All this grout out, this whole okay. section here. Um, just because I was concerned about it. So I and Mr. Moyer insisted that he remove all the grout the and replace it all. And oh, he told us that as he was removing that grout, that Mr. Moyer was sitting there with a vacuum, vacuuming up the, the stained grout. He described precisely where the tiles were located. Since the tiles were porous, he felt confident that some of the red stains still remained. This is the area by the door that we're, that we're really concerned with, the tile guy. Uh, this is the area that he came in and pointed out to us. Uh, some area right in here. Police obtained a warrant to search the Moyers' house. Faye Ann Springer, a criminalist for Sacramento County, examined the tiles for bloodstains. A preliminary examination revealed no outward signs of blood. Okay, I think what we'll do is we'll spray in this area first and then work our way down towards the door. Working systematically, Springer sprayed the area with a chemical called fluorescein, which glows in the presence of minute quantities of blood. Oh, well, we're getting a little weak reaction in a couple of places here. It doesn't identify blood. It only gives you areas of interest. And there were at least two areas of interest in the entryway. What we did then is request that those tiles be actually physically removed because the amount of blood was not visible to the eye. So we wanted to, to look at the sides of the tile to see if blood may have seeped between the actual ceramic tiles and in through the grout. The tiles were brought to the lab 
and did in fact test positive for blood. Springer then had to determine whether or not it was Susan Moyers. And she wasn't sure this could be done. The amount of material was marginal for testing. It's very difficult to test blood stains that are in grout or cement. But I thought there might be enough present on the tiles that they could get enough material, DNA material, out of it. Springer was right. The sample did contain enough DNA for testing. A comparison to the victim's DNA proved the blood on the tiles was Susan Moyers. On March 27, 1993, Ken Moyer was arrested in Sarasota, Florida and returned to California. Investigators pieced together the events that led to Susan's murder. Ken Moyer had courted and married her for money. After the wedding, he moved her to California, far away from loved ones who would ask too many questions. Moyer then enlisted Mitch McLeese and gave him money to help him carry out the murder. On the night of October 27, 1992, McLeese crept up behind the unsuspecting victim and broke her neck. The force of the break caused her nose to bleed and blood to spatter on the floor. Her death was instant. Detectives believe Ken Moyer helped McLeese put his wife's body into the car. And I think that Mitch McLeese sat in the passenger seat and, and reached over and steered the, the vehicle and probably operated the gas with his left foot. Ken Moyer was convicted of the first-degree murder of Susan Moyer. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Mitch McLeese was also convicted of first-degree murder and received an identical sentence. Some killers will go to great lengths to hide their true nature and conceal their crimes. But in Palo Alto, California, it is the secret itself that unmasks a killer. Palo Alto is an affluent bedroom community of San Francisco in the heart of Silicon Valley. This quiet area can offer a sense of security and a refuge away from urban life. But sometimes, danger is closer than it looks. 911 emergency. On May 5th, 2000, police dispatch received a 911 call. A woman had fallen down the stairs and was not breathing. The dispatcher alerted the Palo Alto police and the rescue squad who raced to the scene. Moments later, police arrived at the residence of Marianne and William Slater. Despite all the rescue efforts, it was too late. Marianne Slater could not be resuscitated. 251 dispatch. Go ahead and dispatch me a corner and a detective in this location. Two classes today. There's one at 1020. Detective Mike Denson spoke with the victim's husband. And so William Slater told the investigator to that the nothing unusual happened that day. And, uh, I thought she might still be. He said after their morning jog, Marianne left around 10 o'clock to teach a piano class. And, the other thing is and he left the house an hour later to survey a new building site. He stayed at the site until 1 p.m. When he left to meet some friends for lunch, William said he received a call from his wife's work. Hello. She had not shown up for her second class. That's strange. She was at home when I left. Did you try her cell phone? He grew concerned and called home several times, but there was no answer. 
William also told Detective Denson it was not unusual for Marianne to go home in between classes. When he returned home, he discovered the tragic accident. He said that he looked down the stairs and she was laying on the stairs and uh, was not responsive. He told me that he believed that she had fallen down the stairs and he noticed that she was wearing these particular shoes and he knew that she had fallen in those shoes previously. And so he speculated that she was carrying something down the stairs, um, tripped on the shoes and fell down the stairs. By all accounts, it looked like a terrible accident. Mary Ann, home alone, had tripped, hit her head, and died. An initial assessment of the scene indicated that the victim appeared to have been doing laundry when she fell. Like all unattended deaths, Marianne Slater's body was sent to the coroner's lab for autopsy. Okay. Assistant medical examiner coroner Diane Virtus performed the examination and quickly became suspicious. Yeah, I can see this. I can see the neck. Okay. Well, initially we looked for injuries consistent with the story that she fell down a flight of stairs. What we found was much different than what we were led to believe. The external examination revealed seven separate wounds to all different parts of the head. What's very important about this is that these lacerations were not consistent with a single event. They were much more consistent with multiple blows to the head. And you can feel the crust skull fracture. What about the neck? We also did find some injuries on the hands, and the injuries on the hands were more consistent with what we call defensive wounds. Okay, now we've got a quarter-inch laceration there. Yeah. The evidence suggested Marianne Slater was beaten to death while trying to fend off her attacker. An internal examination revealed additional injuries to Marianne's neck. There were signs of strangulation. This, of course, was completely contrary to uh, a simple fall down the stairs. This is something that uh, we saw some signs of externally and, and became more evident on the internal exam. Dr. Virtus called in Dr. Gregory Schmunk, the chief medical examiner coroner for Santa Clara County. I first became involved with the investigation on a Friday evening when I got a phone call from one of my investigators that a woman had fallen downstairs. I told her to proceed as usual with her investigation. And the next uh, thing that I heard about the case was when I heard the autopsy findings that those autopsy findings were not consistent with a fall down the stairs. After reviewing the crime scene photographs, Dr. Schmunk agreed with Dr. Virtus' findings that Marianne's injuries did not occur from falling. That examination uh, made me conclude that the majority of the blows to the back of the head were not with a striking object, but were more likely the head being impacted against a straight surface or possibly a right-angled surface. Marianne Slater's death was no accident. This was murder. In Palo Alto, Marianne Slater was found dead in her house from what appeared to be an accidental fall. But an autopsy revealed injuries inconsistent with this initial assessment. It now looked as though Marianne was beaten and strangled. Detective Mike Denson of the Palo Alto Police Department believed a recent rash of burglaries in the neighborhood might provide a possible scenario. Over the last six months, there had been several residential burglaries in the Southgate neighborhood. That was a consideration of mine as I began this investigation. He checked previous reports of burglaries. 
Denson theorized the burglar might have been surprised by Marianne and killed her. That's what I came up with also. To test the theory, investigators secured a search warrant and returned to the house. They checked the exterior perimeter, looking for signs of a break-in. There were no signs of forced entry. Inside the house, forensic examiners needed to pinpoint the exact location of her death. They started with the basement steps. Forensic technicians used the chemical luminol to locate the presence of blood. If Marianne had actually fallen and hit her head, there would be a definite pattern of blood. There wasn't any spatter on the stairs at all. From the basement, they backtracked and examined other parts of the house. Since the basement door opened into the kitchen, they began there. We found some blood spatter and some dilute blood stain in the kitchen of the house. I knew at that time that we were going to have to do luminol to bring up a cleaned up crime scene. And so that was our next course of action was to bring the luminol experts in to spray for luminol and detect blood stain. If a room hid a bloody secret, luminol would find it. And in this case, it did exactly that. Someone had tried to cover up a violent act. Chief Medical Examiner Gregory Schmunk. The luminol test revealed that there was extensive blood throughout the house, especially that kitchen and an adjacent bathroom. It looked like there had been a primary crime scene in the kitchen where she had been assaulted and then the assailant had later gone to the bathroom and probably washed up. There was a huge amount of blood discovered and no amount of cleaning could hide it. The kitchen floor glowed with the telltale signs of murder. Upon closer examination of the glow patterns, a partial left shoe print emerged. Mary Ann Slater had been killed in the kitchen and her body moved to the bottom of the stairs afterward. A burglar would have no reason to clean up a crime scene and stage a murder to look like an accident. Mary Ann probably knew her killer. As a matter of routine, police needed to rule out Mary Ann's husband, William, as a suspect. They first checked his alibi, starting with his phone calls. Hoping for anything that might lead to a break in the case, investigators collected the caller ID box from the Slater's telephone, along with Mary Ann's address book. At the state crime lab, a DNA profile was made from the blood found in the Slater's kitchen. The profile was then compared to DNA extracted from Marianne's body during autopsy. To no one's surprise, they matched. Police canvassed the Slater's neighborhood to see if anyone had witnessed anything suspicious on the day of the murder. One neighbor told Sergeant Denson that a silver truck blocked the alleyway behind the Slater house around 12.30 that day. She paid particular attention to that vehicle because it was wide enough and the street was narrow enough that it made it uneasy for her to get around it. So she noticed it and made a mental note of it at that time. She couldn't go anywhere for half an hour. Police knew William Slater drove a silver truck. This would indicate that William was actually in the neighborhood at the time of the murder, not at the work site, as he had told detectives earlier. An officer searched the construction area for any evidence or any one who could corroborate William's story. 
he found nothing. Across the street, the officer noticed a driving range that had a fairly good view of the vacant lot. He questioned the clerk at the golf club to see if she had seen anyone over there on the day in question. The clerk said that she knew William, and although she was working that afternoon, she hadn't seen him or anyone else there. Detective Denson looked closer at the rest of William's story. The Slater's caller ID registered a call from Marianne's work and several calls from William's cell phone. Denson tracked the location of the calls. When you turn a cell phone on or hit send to make a call, the cell phone will search for the strongest signal or the closest cell site to put the call through. Since he was telling me he was on 101 at Woodside Road, he theoretically should have been hitting a cell site close to that location. In fact, he was hitting a cell site that was close to his house. It looked as if police could not eliminate William Slater as a murder suspect. His alibi was falling apart. Police believed the man who just a few days ago seemed like the grieving widower just as we were looking around, was actually a killer. But to prove it, investigators knew they needed to physically link him to the accident. Palo Alto investigators believed William Slater had staged an accident to cover up the murder of his wife. Now they had to prove it. The autopsy revealed that Marianne had been beaten and strangled, and William's alibi had fallen apart. But he didn't appear to have a motive. By all accounts, the Slaters were happy. They recently celebrated their 25th anniversary and had two children together. To learn more, Detective Denson called Marianne's friends and family. My intention was to call all the friends that I could discover in the address book and see if I could find a potential motive. Doing, and I was just calling up and asking them if they could think of anything that would help with the investigation. And ultimately found a friend that was aware of an affair that occurred some 20 years ago. Edward Dale had been a friend of Marianne's for most of her life. Hi, how you doing, sir? This is Sergeant Mike Denson with Palo Alto Police Department. Denson uh, interviewed Dale Denson about his relationship with Marianne and William. About 15 years. He told the detective he had an affair with Marianne. During the time of the affair, Marianne became pregnant with Dale's son. William Slater raised the boy as his own, never suspecting he was not the father of the child. The last time Dale saw Marianne, she told him she planned to reveal their secret to her son on his graduation day. Dale said he was relieved. The secret had gone on too long. The family secret provided police with a possible motive, and Detective Denson did a little more digging. I did a thorough investigation using the FBI Financial Analyst Unit in uh, Virginia and I had them do the full financial records check. He learned the Slaters had money problems and their finances were dwindling away. He was doing his own business, but it was not bringing in very much income, so we basically found them to be broke. Denson learned through friends that Marianne was not aware of their financial problems. William Slater seemed to have many secrets but investigators still had no physical evidence linking him to murder. Police obtained a search warrant to examine the vehicle he had been driving the day his wife was killed. The truck was impounded, and forensic technicians scoured the interior for evidence.
stashed underneath the front seat was a T-shirt. A stain that appeared to be blood was discovered. The shirt was bagged and marked as evidence. A search of the back seat revealed a pair of athletic shoes. The technician noticed several red smudges on them. The items were sent to the state crime lab for analysis. Samples from the stains on both the shoes and the shirt tested positive for human blood. To determine whose blood it was, DNA was extracted from the samples, following careful procedure to avoid contamination of the evidence. A computer-aided comparison was made between the samples and the DNA of the victim, Marianne Slater. They matched. But a small amount of blood might not hold up in court and could possibly be explained away. A print expert examined the left shoe found in William's truck to see if it matched the tread pattern found on the print in Slater's kitchen. After the shoe was inked, a sample print was carefully made and a transparency was created. A comparison revealed both prints had identical tread and matching wear patterns. The prints were made by the shoes in the truck. It was the break police needed. On May 19, 2000, two weeks after the murder of his wife, police arrested William Slater. Although he initially denied any involvement, after several hours of questioning, William confessed to killing his wife. He flew into a rage after his wife revealed her infidelity. At first, he tried to strangle her, but when she fought back, he kicked her to death. He then placed her body at the foot of the basement stairs to stage the accident. And returned to clean up the blood in the kitchen. His life was shaken to the max, and I believe that um, he killed her as a result of that. In addition, they were financially unstable at this point, and his whole life was about to change or changing. William Slater was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Killers who are closest to their victims often believe they can cover up their crimes and fool investigators. But more often, forensic evidence is discovered unmasking the deceit and bringing the perpetrators to justice.